So I go into the prison, I go into the cell, I get on my knees, and I just start weeping. And then it all came, it all became a reality. I saw my whole life flash before me, how I stole from my mom, how I treated people, the drugs, how I've ruined my life. And I just cried out for God. And the craziest things happened, I know like, you know, many people are watching this right now, is that Jesus came and he walked into my prison cell. So Jesus came like a like light and he came into my prison cell. And when I looked at him, it was like, I just became undone. And I became so, um, aware, not only of, at one moment I was so aware of my sin, but then at the next moment I became so aware of His glory. And I said this to, to Jesus, I said, Jesus, many people say they can't see you and they can't hear you, but I'm gonna serve you, but I'm asking you this one thing, I wanna see you for the rest of my life and I wanna hear your voice for the rest of my life. Could you introduce yourself and tell us about your testimony? Sure. My name is Malik Edwards. Um, I'm 40 years old. I've been walking with the Lord now for, I want to say, uh, 20 years. So it's been exciting. Well, actually, it's like 22 years now. And uh, part of my testimony of my salvation t experience is, well, number one, I was born addicted to drugs. So my mother, she used drugs. Uh, she used heroin uh, most of the pregnancy. And so basically, um, uh, I wasn't supposed to make it. They did several operations when I was born, and then they in eventually took me away from my mom. So they took me away from her. Uh, I was living in New Jersey at the time, and so uh, a couple that were looking to have kids, they basically adopted me and my brother. So um, my brother is an amazing, amazing guy, and but you know my family is just you know going through so much, and my mom's a drug addict, so they gave me up, and now introduced to this new family, I got adopted when I was about uh, three years old. And so I went just a little bit through foster care. My brother was like my, like a half brother. We had the same mom, different dad. And he, um, how can I say it? He was gone, he went through the foster care system. So when they adopted him, he's about five years older than me. So he must've been, I don't know, maybe about eight years old at the time. So we grew up together and my parents immediately told me about God. I went to like a seven day Adventist school and you know, it was a really cool experience, but I really didn't know God. And so uh, at a young age, I started having encounters with God. Like I would have encounters with God. I would have encounters with, you know, devils, uh, angels and demons. And I would um, have uh, these nights where something would pull me under my bed and just crazy things was going on. And there was really no language in my house to like tell me what was going on. My mom was a Lutheran, like dedicated Lutheran. And my dad, you know, he just was, I don't think he really believed in God at that moment. And even with those experiences, with like being pulled, like mm -hmm. was that like in the physical? Were you dreaming? No, was no, no. Like it was like I would maybe be in this uh, dreaming state, but then I actually end up waking up out of it and being underneath my bed or seeing different uh, spirits and stuff like that, like entering my room. Uh, I had a hard time sleeping a lot of times because of a lot of dreams. I dreamed a lot. And, you know, like when you grow up in a you know, a house that maybe doesn't believe in the supernatural like that, you kind of, um, yeah, you kind of don't know what to do with it. So that was kind of my experience. And so my mom was like really into like astrology and numerology and all these kind of things. So I grew up with a lot of that also in the atmosphere. So you could just imagine how um, uh, oppressive my atmosphere was a lot of the time. So uh, basically about the time I was, I would say about eight or nine, my brother, uh, so it's crazy. So my family lived um, maybe eight minutes away from where we lived. My brother knew that where my family lived because he, he saw my mom put the needles in her arm. He saw her, you know, overdose. And so he was going back and forth just to see if she was okay. He didn't want to go back and live in that atmosphere, but he was just going back. And so my adoptive family decided that it w they should terminate the adoption. So they terminated his adoption means like, no more, he's, he's not their son anymore. And you know, that, that really broke me, hurt me. They explained to me what, what was happening, but in an eight year old, nine year old mind, you know, that's very traumatic. And so if, I think from that, that was like the turning point. Like my brother was like my protector in a sense. And so I think from that point, I ended up, um, uh, you know, just uh, getting a little bit more curious, uh, rebelling a little bit more. So I would say about the age of, 11 and 12, I started to uh, get introduced to pornography, started to get to introduced to the world, basically. Uh, I started getting bullied in school, you know, like in fifth, sixth grade, you know, I was just peculiar, I was different. And, uh, and um, a lot of the kids didn't like that. And you know how kids are, they could be cruel. And so uh, I turned to, by the time I was 13, 14, I started smoking weed. 
So I started smoking weed, getting introduced to, um, you know, acid, LSD, you know, hallucinogenic, stuff like that. And, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you know, when God has a call on your life, the enemy tries to come in right away to, you know, to, to, to do the opposite, right? And so here I am at young age having these dreams, being able to see in the spirit, and now I'm taking these uh, hallucinogenic stuff. So it was a crazy, crazy experience. So uh, from there, from about 13 to 15, I started actually getting into selling drugs. So now I'm rolling my peoples, uh, you know, I'm rolling, we have a, like a little gang, we have a little, you know, whatever, and now we're selling drugs in our school, and I'm, but at the same time, I'm still like not the cool kid, we're not the cool kids at all, you know, we're just, uh, we're just potheads, and we're getting high on our own supply, basically, and so we go through this whole, uh, you know, high school experience, and, um, and uh, but at the same time, God is still like pugging, uh, tugging at my heart, I know God is real, but I really don't know how to get to him. And so um, I started selling for my mom. I started to hustle. I mean, I was just, you know, girls, all that kind of stuff. And it ended up where uh, I got uh, put into juvenile detention because I, I got caught with a whole bunch of weed. And uh, they put me in juvenile detention. I got out. I, I just couldn't stop smoking. I was smoking. I was drinking. I was just whatever. So now I'm about like 17. Uh, they say, you know what, you got a problem, and so we're going to put you in what they call an inpatient program, inpatient programs for drug addicts. And I'm like, I just smoke weed, you know, I'm not like doing crack, I'm not doing heroin, but obviously I had a problem. So they put me in this inpatient program. Right before that, I met this guy, um, I was working for the DPW, Department of Public Works, and this guy uh, was a Christian. And when I was on the truck with him, they put me, the assignment to the truck with him. He would always tell me, young man, you got a call on your life. Young man, a, God has something amazing for you. And like, he would tell me this every day and I felt something behind it, but I really didn't know how to translate that into my own life and what I was doing. And so I remember I started getting these headaches and I basically just quit the job and, and then it ended up uh, subsequently going to an uh, outpatient program. I get to the outpatient program. Uh, I'm there for about two days getting sober. The third day, I have interest in the third day, I have this, uh, what do you call it? I have this encounter with God, right? Where I'm praying and I'm saying, God, I want to be, I wanted to be a basketball player. I wanted to be a rapper. I still rap a little bit. Uh, I want to, you know, be a part, do all these things. And so here I am uh, asking God, what do you have for me? And it was like, like uh, now I know it's the audible voice of God is what I heard, but at that time I was like freaked out because I heard the voice of God and he said, I've called you to preach the gospel. I've called you to be a reverend. I've called you, you know, into the, to the nations. And so I'm like processing all this stuff. The next day my mom comes to pick me up uh, from the outpatient or comes to visit me. Sure enough, she comes with this guy. I didn't know she's bringing this guy with her from the truck. Somehow he came, I don't know how they connected. He came and you think I would run to my mom, but I ended up running to this guy and saying, God spoke to me that I'm gonna, you know, you know, gonna go to the nations, I'm gonna be a preacher, et cetera. But at the same time, like I had an encounter with God, but I didn't fully have this experience of giving my life totally over to him. So I got out, I was excited. I started writing like positive rap and, you know, and, uh, but eventually I got, you know, the Bible talks about those seven spirits that come back even wickeder. So I, it, I ended up even worse, more strung out on drugs, more LSD. Um, my mom kicked me out of the house. There's a whole story about how I was homeless for a little bit of time and God provided places to stay, et cetera. But it was, I was in a bad shape. So at the same time, I'm going to the city to buy drugs. I, oh, I, two days before that, I have, I'm smoking weed with my friends. We're smoking marijuana, and then the Holy Spirit, now I know it's the Holy Spirit, like came on me, and I started to prophesy. I mean, I started to speak what I felt like God was saying. And I said, I have brothers, I have sisters, and I know I'm gonna find them. My whole life is about to change. And then boom, I come out of it, I'm still smoking. And my friend's like, yo, Malik, you are crazy. Like, you got total issues, right? Well, two days later, I go to New York City, get some drugs, come back to my high school. I come back to my high school, and this girl comes up to me, approaches me. No, no, my friend says, somebody's here to see you. It's this girl, pretty beautiful woman. And she comes up to me. I'm like, oh, my God. She said, are you, are you Malik? And I said, yes. And she said, uh, I just want, I, I want to tell you, I'm your, I'm your sister. And I'm like, what? You're my sister? She's like, yeah, I'm your sister. And she had a little boy that looked just like me when I was young. And he, she was like, this is your nephew. And matter of fact, you got 
three, um, you have three younger brothers and you actually have uh, another sister and obviously my brother who I was adopted with. And I was blown away. I knew I had a brother, but I didn't know I had this whole big family. So that day I went with her. Uh, I met my mom, my biological mom for the first time. Uh, I say this is the first woman I fell in love with first sight. Uh, she had just uh, come out of chemotherapy. She had HIV. She had just had a breast removal, hard lifestyle. She lived the war. And uh, so here I am in, now I'm in the hood. Now I'm living in this place that is even darker than where I came out of. And so I just started keep selling drugs. And the long story short is, um, even though I met my family having this great experience, I'm still in these cycles, I'm still in darkness. And it ends up where I get caught selling drugs to an undercover cop. My friend was being set up. And at that time, I was like, hey, I'll just sell drugs for you. Just You just go do what you got to do, I think, with some girl or whatever. So I, you know, he gives me the drugs, and, and he's getting set up. So I get set up in the meantime. So basically, um, uh, I have to have a court date where I have to you know, go to. And this is crazy. We talk about generational curses and stuff like that. My mom, I, my mom's like, who's your, who's your judge? Who's the judge you're going before? I'm saying, I'm going before Judge Gator. She said, Judge Gator? She said, I, he's the first judge to lock me up. She's like, you know what? Just tell him that you just found your family, like your whole life is turning around. He's going to let you go. So I get to the court. They tell me, uh, young man, you know, you, you've been sentenced to three years in prison. I'm like, oh my God. So like, it's getting real right now. And so I'm like, okay. So I go before the, you know, I'm standing before the judge and he says, young man, do you have anything to say? So obviously I hear my mom in the back of my head, like, this is your chance. And I felt the hand of God. I know now it's the hand of God. And it came over my mouth. I couldn't say anything. And I heard the audible voice of God say, um, you're not, you're not, um, how does he say? He said, you're being rescued. He said, in this moment, I'm rescuing you. And it was like, oh my gosh. So I ended up going to prison. And when you go into prison the first time, they put you in something called the suicide watch. That's basically where you don't have no sheets, you don't have nothing. And they put you in toilet paper so you don't hang yourself or kill yourself. And so I remember in this little tiny room with a little tiny window. So I remember looking out of this little tiny window and I saw these group of gods and they were praying. They were just holding hands and praying. And I said to myself, I wanna be in that circle tomorrow night. And so I got out, obviously, of that, that situation. I was uh, put in population. And that night, I, I saw those guys praying. I went right up to them and said, hey, can I pray with you guys? So I stood in a circle, you know, and just bowed my head and just, you know, whatever. So about two weeks later, um, with a course of events, the guy who was in my prison cell, which is a crazy story, uh, decided that he was going to leave. The, he didn't want to be in the prison cell with me for whatever reason. So he decides, I don't want to be in the prison cell with this guy. He, com he, he almost commands them to get, to get him out, like almost like I was, something was wrong with me. And uh, I found out later that he was telling me to my face, like, oh, this is my son. I'm taking care of him. But to the other guys in prison, he was saying he's a punk and he's a chump or whatever. So God was removing him. So the same day that he gets out, uh, they shut our prison down. So that means that we all have to go into our prison cell. They lock it down until they open it back up. So here I'm in a cell and I hear a guy right before I go into the lockdown, I hear a guy outside of my cell praying and preaching the gospel to everyone just open and I said hey I want to can we have a Bible I mean I don't even know I, I got this language I was like can we have a Bible study tonight and he's like of course young man we can have a Bible study tonight so I go into the prison I go into the cell I get on my knees and I just start weeping and then it all came it all became a reality I saw my whole life flash before me how I stole from my mom how I treated people the drugs how I've ruined my life and I just cried out for God. And the craziest things happened, I know like, you know, many people are watching this right now, is that Jesus came and he walked into my prison cell. So Jesus came like a like light and he came into my prison cell. And when I looked at him, it was like, I just became undone. And I became so um, aware, not only of, at one moment I was so aware of my sin, but then at the next moment I became so aware of his glory. And I said this to, to Jesus, I said, Jesus, many people say they can't see you and they can't hear you but I'm gonna serve you, but I'm asking you this one thing. I wanna see you for the rest of my life and I wanna hear your voice for the rest of my life. And funny enough, you know, long story short, many years later, you know, that's what my ministry has been marked by is by seeing Jesus and hearing his voice. But in this moment, I, I came into this experience and I gave my life over to the Lord. I said, God, forgive me for all the things I've done. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. And so it, the craziest thing is right after that, I. The prisons open up magically, right? But wait, but wait. Before, before you move on from there, you can't, you can't just move on that quick from there. This, if you could just describe in more words yeah. what that encounter was yeah. like. 
Yeah, I think the the encounter itself, it wasn't like some long drawn out. I've heard people say like, I talked to Jesus for hours. It wasn't like that. It was simply, I was in a broken place. Jesus walks in. I, I'm, you know, it's, it's like, and this I, is in the physical. This is in the physical. So this is like a, a physical spiritual experience, right? So you see Jesus walk in, but he's a ball of light. You don't see many people walking around like a light and a fire. So he's a light and a fire. He's kind of in the midst of it. And I'm like, oh, snap. And then I'm undone. Now I'm like, I see him and I go back into like this place of, of prayer, this place of like uh, brokenness before God, but also being aware that now Jesus is in the room with me. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so keep going. So, so basically the, the prisons open up and I'm like, oh, snap. Like I just had an encounter with God. Like Jesus just walked in like I'm undone. So I have a meeting with this guy. Now, remember, I prayed. I said, God, I want to see you and I want to talk to you. Obviously, I did see him, but I'm saying I want to have a continual relationship with you. So I'm sitting down with this guy. I found out that this guy basically has life in prison. Like he's, he's going to be away for a long time. We're in a, a county prison right now, and he's going to be transferred to a, a, a public prison or a, what do you call it, like a, a, a you know, state prison, and then eventually be away for 40, 50 years or whatever. So here I am sitting with this guy. He's, had, he's full of the joy of the Lord. We're having this Bible study. All of a sudden, everything fades away. Everything just kind of like goes blank. And it's like this. Um, I always talk to people like there's this uh, show, old school show called uh, um, The Last Dragon. It's uh, Bruce Leroy. It's uh, like the black version. And like in this version, it talks about like the glow where you get the glow. You know, the glow comes over you and show enough and all these people. But anyway, this guy's sitting in front of me and this glow comes all over him. And I see like the same glory that I came to my prison I'm, uh, in my cell. I'm seeing it on this man. And while he's talking to me, it's like his voice is like the voice of many waters. It's like echoing. And God speaks to me. Now God's speaking to me. He, this guy's talking to me and I'm hearing God behind me say, you want to see me? I speak through my people and I show myself through my people. I was blown. I was done. And I was just like in awe. And, it, and people were trying to like come in. Like I was aware that there were other things that were happening, but no one could come into this bubble that we were in. And so here I am in this place. And so boom, we come out of the experience. We grab each other's hand. You know, I told him I just gave my life to the Lord. So he prays for protection. That moment he prays for protection, um, these scales, these black like scales are like a very thin, yeah, all you think it say is like scales or, or film. It falls from my eyes as we say amen from this prayer. I see these things spiral down to the ground and they evaporate. Let me just finish the story with this. The next day, uh, you know, I've uh, been in prison for about three weeks now. So the next day they, um, they do like a checkup, make sure everything. When I came into prison, I was jacked up. I had like 104 degree fever. I was just not in a good place. And so this, I'm sitting there waiting for the checkup. This guy from across the room runs up to me storming, super mad. What's up with your eyes? What's wrong with, look, what's, on, what's going on in your eyes? What happened to you? Oh, I know what happened to you. You gave your life to Jesus. I'm like blown. I'm just sitting there like, yo, what is going on? So he say, oh yeah, you met with Jesus. Oh, you had an encounter with God. Oh, you know, I mean, just crazy. And so eventually, so basically he's like, well, if, if your God ain't real, if your God is real, tell him to move this chair. So he takes a chair and he pulled, you know, slams it down in front of me. And I'm just sitting there like, yo, like I have... But from that moment, I realized how, how real my encounter with Jesus was, how real my experience was. And I was in prison for about, I got, actually got out of prison early. The guy who actually, I told you, had 50, maybe 60 years, he got out within a week of that moment. Isn't that crazy? Within a week, something happened. Everything got turned around. He told me it was going to happen. And he got, and so my whole uh, prison experience was basically coming close to the Lord. I was able to lead many people to the Lord. That's a whole nother story. And, uh, and so, yeah, that's how God uh, changed my life. So I went from there and now I'm, I'm traveling all over the world, going to the nations. I have a church, I have a beautiful wife, a beautiful family, and I'm just excited for this next season. If you could in, encapsulate, um, you know, your life right now with Jesus, right? Um, what can you say he has done in your life? And that is a, that is a big question. Yeah. But for people watching um, yeah. that just want to know, yeah. what has Jesus done yeah. in your life? I think the biggest thing is that Jesus has showed me how much he loves me. And in this, especially in this last season, realizing like the price that he paid, 
you know, many times, you know, in, in our movements and what God has done, you know, through me, I've seen people healed. I've seen the dead raised. We've seen so many things. And you get so caught up in, like, the power and God's, you know, amazingness. But just this last season, he started to wreck me again about the passion, about him dying on the cross for me. And I think that in this last season and just encapsulating my um, walk with the Lord, he's always brought me back to the price that he paid for me and that what I deserve, like, I don't have to take that punishment, that he took all that punishment for me. And so Jesus has really been a savior for me personally. And, you know, I guess it's a vulnerable thing, but Jesus is a friend. You know, Jesus is someone that I can talk to on a daily basis, and, and he's God, but he's also, he's also, he sticks closer than a brother. And, you know, in life you can have betrayal, you can have people that leave, you can have people that have opinions about you, especially in our day and hour, social media, et cetera. But Jesus has been that. I'll tell you one quick thing. I remember I was fasting for 40 days. It was a, a crazy experience, one of my first fasts. And in this fast, um, I was like, I was cheating. I ain't gonna lie. I was like, every day I was like, I have a little Snicker bar here, a little chip there. It was like, it's day eight, but I'm still in it, you know? And so I'm like in this service, I'm, 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 I'm kind of, you know, shameful that, you know, I'm not eating, but I'm having these little tiny things. So I, I remember, you know, I was still a little weak, so during the worship, I just laid on the floor. It was that kind of church. I was able to lay on the floor. Immediately, I go into a vision, and in the vision, I'm on a barbecue grill, and I, I can see the fire. Like, I'm on this grill, and I'm like, God, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can you know, go these 40 days with you. And all of a sudden, I just had this instinct to, like, look to the side, and Jesus was on the grill with me, and he was like, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. And those, you know, if you ever seen Jesus, like his eyes are full of love. Like you can't even talk about seeing him without like just feeling that bubbling of joy and confidence. So anyway, I come out of that and I able to go through that 40 day fast, like no problem. And I'm saying that to say, that's what my walk with Jesus has been like. Every time, like I feel like I, I can't make it. I feel like, man, I don't know what I can do or I've made a mistake or whatever the case is. I look over and Jesus is right there and he's saying, I'm right there with you. So I guess that kind of encapsulates my relationship with God.